I'd like to introduce my panel, and I will ask each of them to introduce themselves a little more, but we have all the way over there, Caroline Wong from Sigital. Hello. We have Wei Lin from Symantec. Hi. And we have Emily Stark from Google, and I'm Lisa Napier. So I'd like to ask everybody to, or Caroline, if you can introduce yourself more thoroughly and tell us how you got into security place. Cool. I, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so my name is Caroline Wong. Um, I'm currently a director at Sigital, which is a software security consulting firm. Um, and I've been doing security stuff for like 10 years now. Um, I started out leading information security teams at eBay and at Zynga uh, before transferring to what I jokingly refer to as the dark side uh, when I started working for Symantec in the vendor community uh, and then started doing consulting at Sigital two and a half years ago. Um, and I got into security in sort of a random random way. Um, I had studied electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley, um, and between my junior and senior year, uh, applied to any internship that, that I was qualified for, ended up doing a, a, an internship at eBay in IT project management, uh, loved it, uh, and then upon graduation said, I'd like to work for you full time. And my intern boss said, well, IT has a hiring freeze, but there are these entry-level positions available in information security. And I said, I don't know anything about that. And he said, that's okay. Uh, you know, they're just looking for smart college kids to train. Uh, and so the night before my interview, I went and I memorized the Wikipedia page on information security, and, and that was all I had going in. Uh, but but they were right. You know, they were they were just kind of looking for someone to train up. Um, and, and the other thing about that interview was that there were four people, the hiring manager was the last person, and so they'd ask me these questions, and then they kind of would like tell me the answer. So by the time the important person was, was asking me questions, uh, I was prepared. And, and then I just found out that I liked it. So here we are. Okay, very fascinating uh, experience in the history. So uh, I'm willing. I have been working for Symantec for 15 and a half years. So how did I get into security? Uh, before Symantec, I worked in uh, aerospace in Canada, Montreal, very cold. And at that time was dot com era, and most of my friends, uh, they all moved to the US. Then I said, okay, I will try my chance in the US. So I start to look for a job. Then this headhunter found me and said, hey, how about Symantec? I said, who is Symantec? So I look up, at that time Google wasn't that famous, so we didn't use the word Google, so I looked up in internet, and I typed it wrong. I typed Symantec, it's a Symantec, right? So it's not Symantec. I said, no, I'm not interested. So they, they realized right away I typed the wrong name. Instead, S-Y-M-A-N-T-E-C, I typed S-E-M-A-N-T-E-C. So they said, did you type the right thing? Here is the name. I said, oops, okay, so I look up. Then I said, huh, interesting. Internet security, and now we're in dot com, and you know the web thing seems very interesting. I said, okay, I will give a try. So I came to Santa Monica at that time. Our office is in Santa Monica, the Norton branch, in March. So Canada was all white snow, Santa Monica, flower beaches. I said, wow, that's a place I want to come, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> so I got into the Norton group. Um, then they said, okay, what job do you want? I was already a manager. Um, I said, oh, I never program on PC. I never knew anything about internet security. I said, I want to start as a developer. So, Ellery already, you were already part of the Norton group. So, I remember they said, okay, you come in. And I just joined and started to work on a little project called License at that time. And three months later, my boss came and said, okay, yeah, we really need a manager. We want you be the manager for Norton Antivirus. So I start real manager job in Norton first, then move on to uh, the security solution for Norton product and the uh, enterprise security product. Then I move back again, working on leading Norton product development. Uh, six years ago, I was uh, appointed to start the Norton Mobile Security Product Development. So over the years, it's all around security, but ironically, last year I took a new job. It's no longer, I'm no longer on the security side, but I'm leading the engineering team for the Norton um, e-business, basically run the e-store. Okay, that's my story. Uh, okay, I'm Emily. Um, 
I have been on the Google Chrome security team for one year and one day. Um, <clears throat> I got into uh, security when um, I was an undergrad at Stanford and I was uh, doing a summer research program in computer science um, the, fr the summer after my freshman year. And uh, I was doing research in an area of computer science that wasn't really doing it for me. And so I decided to go uh, find some other type of research that I wanted to do. And so I um, walked into Dan Bonet's office having no idea who he was. Um, not, you know, if you don't know who Dan Bonet is, he's like a very famous uh, cryptographer who I would have been far too intimidated to talk to if I had known that at the time. So um, I walked into his office and asked him to give me a research project. And he did, and worked. I uh, worked with him through undergrad, and found that I liked that field a lot. So decided to um, to stay in it. Very good. Thank you. I'm Lisa Napier, and I have perhaps the oddest. I fell backwards into security. I started off um, as an art major, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, and decided to get work as a computer trainer because I liked computers. That ended up uh, tripping, stumbling into database documentation, database programming, programming tech support, and with a company that ended up getting acquired by Cisco, and uh, found that I loved the networking concept and just all the fun things we were doing, and my company that was the acquisition was a... Cisco at that point was layer three and below, and we were layer four up to the political layer, for those of you who get that joke. And uh, the <laughs> with that expertise in all of the layers of the stack, that translated into focusing on a lot of security products at the time that were at the network layer, so firewalls and things like that, that um, my team became experts at, and that was how I stumbled into security. Worked to set up Cisco's incident response team for their product security side, and have been doing product security related tasks since then. And uh, so it's you know some of the best mistakes that I've ever made in stumbling backwards into security. But that was how I got into it, not a plan. <laughs> Let's see, so we're here talking about some of the challenges that, um, you know, our industry is very um, male-oriented and male-dominated. And I'd like to ask our panel, you know, some of those, what, why, do you guys have any ideas on why you think that is? Okay, so I take on this. Um, so from my experience, right, um, the IT industry, software industry, is traditionally male dominant, uh, like most of the engineering uh, field. And over the year, I've been involved in many of these women initiative in IT or in tech sector. Uh, we have discussed a lot about this. Why is that? It's a little look at it, just the, the whole population, right? And we look back, if we say the male dominant industry has been a tradition, you know, what has changed, right? And look at the pipeline, look at where we can find a source, right? And it starts showing some very discouraging number. In 1985, female population earned 35% of computer science undergrad degree. In 2011, the number went down to 17%. So that's not very encouraging. Um, and also, if you go back, look at, we have less female students in CS. So that also just feed the industry with less population. Okay, so the situation has not been increased. It has gone to the wrong direction. So I think that's a question in many organizations have been working through how we can increase our pipeline. We can talk this a little bit later. Yeah, I think, 
you know, from, from my perspective, I think it's really an exposure thing, you know, for young girls. Um, as a young girl, I wanted to grow up and be a giraffe, and then I wanted to grow up and be a rock star. And as I grew up, you know, the people that I knew were teachers. My father was an attorney, so I was like, I want to be a teacher. I want to be an attorney. I didn't know any information security professionals, and I certainly didn't know about their salaries um, or about their lifestyles. Um, you know, perhaps when I was five years old, uh, my job didn't really exist at that time, so I couldn't aspire to, to say that was something I wanted to do. Um, you know, today my job, my, my job and, and, and my lifestyle because of my job is awesome. Um, I'm a consultant, I work from home, you know, 50% of the time. I've, I've got a 10 month old daughter and working from home is great because I get to be with her a lot. And then I get to travel and I get to come to stuff like this and I get to go to exotic locales, you know, and fly business class. And, and it's this really sweet life, but I didn't know as a five-year-old girl, as a 10-year-old girl, as a 15-year-old girl, that this was that this was like an option for me because I, I, I wasn't exposed to it. Um, another thing that I want to mention um, relating to the pipeline is that it's certainly a true truth that the pipeline is a problem that you know there are just not enough women coming into this field, um, but there are also a lot of striking statistics about how the the funnel tapers as you go from individual contributors to managers to um, executives, and so it's while the the pipeline is certainly a problem, there is also a problem of um, of losing women at every stage, um, and so I think. It has to be the 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 fix has to be an effort that uh, that focuses on on all stages of that funnel, which doesn't really answer your question at all. But it's <laughs> no, it, it actually leads into one of the other questions on there. But um, you know, what are some of the reasons that women that you know now this is a bit unfair because you you women are clearly in tech. We all are, and you know the. But why are some of the reasons that what are some of the reasons for the attrition of women dropping out of tech? And you know, are that that funnel issue? Thoughts? You know, ironically, we're we're like the wrong people to ask, right? Um, you know, I'm sitting here next to Way, and she's an executive at Symantec, which is like one of the biggest security firms in the world. Um, but it's interesting. You know, we could think about female colleagues that that we've known. Um, you know, at different at different points in our careers, and think about you know, and there's so many so many individual uh, reasons for it. Perhaps we're not the right people to ask, which is a kind of a good thing. Well, I can say that I you know while I am still in tech, I have thought about dropping out of tech many times, and have felt many times like I can't do this. I'm done. Got to go. Like. I don't know, do something else. I don't know what it would be, but um, the times that I have thought about doing something else, it's uh, it's mostly like, a, you know, there's a feeling of exhaustion that I think uh, hopefully a lot of people can resonate with. Um, you know, I think this is a field that, that attracts really smart people, and so the competition is really tough. Um, it's it's a very intense field to be in. There, the demands are high. Um, it's a fantastic lifestyle, but it's also a demanding one, um, and uh, that that gets exhausting. You know, I don't know if that's specific to being underrepresented, except that I think there is an additional degree of exhaustion from just feeling different all the time, like. You know, when you're the when you are sitting at a table surrounded by people who are very different from you, there's this feeling of like managing your the way you come across, uh, th thinking just like stressing about uh, how you're representing your gender or how you're uh, how how people are perceiving you, whether you are whether you're struggling against some kind of bias. Uh, I think that kind of additional stress contributes to like a, a kind of fatigue that can settle on people. People in this industry talk a lot about burnout and I don't think that is something that people in, under, uh, in other industries um, experience quite as universally. That's, that's a really good point. There was a, a wonderful movie that's been out um, called Code and it's about girls in technology. And one of the studies that they cited in that that I just found fascinating is they studied some undergrads in math, so um, just in terms of how women do in math. 
And the study was fascinating in terms of addressing that specific fatigue. And what they, what they concluded was that um, women in situations, in certain situations, have a, a sense of <laughs> where women were representing this whole group. And that fatigue of just that pressure causes the test scores to drop. And so they did that, the exam, or the, the, um, the uh, what do you call it? Um, the experiment where the women and men were told, we're giving you an exam, it's a standard math exam. And the women did, you know, the same group of people, the women did like 20 to 30 percent poorer on the exam than the men did in the same class, and they were matched skill, skill for skill. They did a separate, you know, on different day, separate exam, and said this exam is biased in that men and women tend to do, tend to score exactly the same on it. Just that instruction changed the scores, and the women actually outperformed the men because they didn't have that <laughs> women suck at math mental garbage that goes on, that static. And <laughs> I found that just so fascinating that they were able to replicate this study and uh, kind of demonstrate that, that impact of those societal biases. Um, I'd like to add um, another observation. Um, I think over the years, uh, if you look at uh, within the tech sector, you have pure technical Pass, you have management pass, you have different functional group, QA dev, um, and product management, program management. What I want to really point out here is the interest of change. Many women start as engineer, QA or dev. Um, then quickly, they would decide to move to another functional group. QA, often first thing they would jump to is program management. Uh, and dev, they would, would want to move to product management. So their interest of staying on the pure tech sector change, quickly changed from very interested to I want to do something else. Now, I never really analyzed why, but it's a very, very obvious, why right? Many of these women went to a certain level, they just stop. They say, okay, I want to do something else. They move out. So today, if you look at stats, right, like Samantha has a sim fantastic stats on women percentage in leadership, uh, in exec, in, at board, but if you decipher them, separate them from marketing, from product management to pure engineering, right? Engineering is always below. Uh, that's a sector I'm most concerned because I'm still in that sector as you know, leading engineering group, right? And I want to see more women stay on that. Uh, Samantha had very early on a female fellow, and she left. After that, we never have another female fellow. So keeping women on tech track is even more a more daunting and challenging job for us as women, how we can encourage our um, other female engineers to stay on the engineering track. Mm. And I have often run into the, um, you know, the, the shock and surprise of colleagues meeting them that I am technical and, um, you know, that there is the, oh, you know, you actually understand technology, which is, it's one of those little things, it's a tiny little, you know, I brush it off, but it's that death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, it, it does really get old of that, you know, as a, as a woman in technology, I feel like there is constant credential checking. Do you really know what you're talking about, you know? Um, and I don't know, have you, yeah, I think uh, I used to like go to RSA a few years ago, right? I, I, I go, I've gone to RSA like a bunch, but I remember when I started going to RSA and people would be like, oh, you know, what do you do? And I would say, well, you know, I'm on the information security team at eBay. I do A and B and C. And they'd be like, oh, you know, I, I thought you were in marketing. And I was like, oh, that, you know, there's there's a bias and you're and you're sharing your bias with me and I have an opportunity to 
you know, point out that I am an exception to your bias, which is which is kind of cool. Um, and you know, these are back then sort of the days of booth babes, which is like a no-no, which is great that it's a no-no. Um, and then there's this interesting thing about like, you know, at RSA, there's like a lot of parties, there's a lot of drinking, and then like at 11 p.m., you know, you're like a woman and you're at one of these parties and everyone's just wasted. And then people have certain types of behaviors that they exhibit, you know, and so it's it's just a really interesting thing um, that happens, but I can relate to it. And I'll, and I'll share another story, which is not mine, um, but which is uh, a female vice president um, at eBay, and uh, she would go around with a couple of her direct reports, and they would have vendor meetings, and vendors would come in, and they would ask her to bring in a chair, or they would ask her to bring in some coffee. And she would do it, because she was like, this is hilarious, because you're gonna find out in five minutes that I'm the person you're trying to sell to. <laughs> you know, so, so there was this way in which the bias really screwed the person with the bias. And, and I think that, you know, it's, it's great that the, the organizers of this conference uh, invited us to talk about this thing and to share our stories. And, you know, with, with each interaction that happens where bias is obvious or perhaps less obvious, you know, there's an opportunity for us to just sort of say the truth and say, Actually, I, I have a degree from UC Berkeley in electrical engineering and computer science. Actually, I, you know, whatever. And then, and then bit by bit, people uh, become exposed to the reality. So, thank you, Caroline. That was, I, I love that bit about um, bias. Those examples of bias are really an opportunity to educate and reevaluate you know, change people's minds, because that's, and in my mind, one of the most challenging things are the um, the hidden bias, the bias that people won't admit to. And, you know, I have to admit <laughs> that I, you know, became aware that I had my own bias, that I was, you know, at the beginning of my career, I loved the idea that I was the, the one girl, the one chick who got it, and, who wasn't like all the other girls. And so I had, you know, I participated in this bias of I'm the only technical person, you know, I'm the only technical woman here. All the other women are probably marketing or soft skills stuff. And, you know, coming to terms with my own bias was a little bit of a, oh man. <laughs> um, it's an unpleasant moment, but that's the only, recognizing it is the only way we can begin to change these things and admitting that bias exists. We all have biases based on our experience, you know, who we've run our class in life. And, um, but becoming aware of those and owning that bias and trying to do something better is about it. Uh, let's see, on my, questions. Um, let's see, for the panel, what do you see as some of the biggest obstacles in the industry? I think Emily did a great job of talking about sort of the competitiveness, you know, some of the exhaustion. You know, I think that with engineering, regardless of whether you're male or female, you know, there is this fixation on like solving a problem. And sometimes that takes these like circuitous routes and you're like up all night and you're just trying to figure it out. And, and maybe, um, maybe you're able to sort of manage your, your work life and your energy balance, you know, and maybe you're not and maybe you burn out. Um, but I think that happens to, to both men as well as women. So talking about fatigue, I, I remember my early time at Norton. We, every year, we have huge release. And before release, there was a period. We work very hard, uh, you know, and we probably remember, right? We spend many nights, entire 24 hours, during several days in the office. We did not leave, Dave also was there, right? We did not leave, we stayed there for a week or two, just 24 by seven, right? So just imagine if you have a young family, you have young kids, it's very hard on your family. Um, so that's one, I think other obstacle is when it comes to um, promotion and 
paving a path for women, right? We need male allies. We need our male counterpart, our male peers to support us. So this is not only from just a low level. We need from top down. We need C-suite. We need companies to support the idea that women brings value so they can support women. Now, I saw cases where the CC, there are people say, yes, I support women. But you can see these are not really true from their heart because nothing happened. They did nothing. And you see other C suite, they really is coming from their heart. They will do, they will carry out some of these specific tasks to encourage women. Uh, encourage women, especially on the tech sector, right? And really staying on engineering paths. So these we can we can see the huge difference. Having male support or not. So I'm really glad to see a good portion of male uh, attendance here, right? You are our ally. You can make this world change. And if you help your peers in your company, you will make their life a very big difference. Um, and it in, in addition to the, the, the burnout, um, another thing that's been a major challenge for, for me, and I think that a lot of people uh, talk about, is imposter syndrome. And I think it has the same kind of source of like everyone's just really smart. So, you know, when you're like in elementary school, it's like really easy to be the smart kid. Um, but, you know, when you're in a field full of the most, like the smartest, most talented, most dedicated people, like most people that I've ever worked with in my life are not only really, really brilliant, but also like work really hard and have lots of hobbies and like are just amazing people in every possible way. Um, so it's really easy to feel completely inadequate. Um, so I don't really know what to do about that, but um, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Since we just mentioned about family, I think that's something we haven't talked about, and that's actually very important. So I think why I feel, based on my experience, there's two problems. One is the pipeline. I grew up in China. I think in China, uh, we studied this, like, a uh, woman half the sky. So, um, like, we have more women uh, in major in, like, engineering. So, but even that, in my class, of all of 30 students, only five, seven are women. Uh, some of them us choose to stay in technology. So I, I'm not sure for people who grow up here, how many percentage of your girls major in engineering? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like in your class? 35, right? 35? Yeah. 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 yeah, OK. So, so then when I enter security, I actually major in security in China. I choose security because I think that's very special field. A lot of my uh, male uh, partner or student classmates, they actually doing a lot of developments. So at that time, was a little field. So, so it's interesting that when I came to US, I studied my career at security, I actually at CGO. I was the only women engineer at that time. So there was one thing I want to mention. I, I want to be brutally direct. All, all of my um, fem uh, male, um, like uh, co uh, co-workers, they have a wife, uh, housewife, so they have support in their families. For for all women, mostly ma um, women majoring engineers, so most their husband also work, and so we have to also support family. We don't have the support our co-workers, male co-workers has. So a lot of time, what I see for my like, if I have any women peer, they end up making decisions based on the opportunity that's better for supportive family. So like the reason I quit doing consulting and move to Wild Fargo is because they support working from home. So that's a perfect time when I have my kids. But for all my um, male partners, uh, like male uh, co-workers, they all make, uh, take risky uh, moves. They move around the country. They were able to pick uh, better opportunities. So I think in order to do that, company also need to provide better support. I literally had, uh, when I was pregnant, I literally in the meeting, one, um, when another male co-worker, he, uh, his wife was uh, pregnant, and she was working at that time. But the uh, co-worker said, there's no question, once we have the kid, my wife will give up, um, give up um, and uh, take care of the kids, and because children is the most important. 
I was pregnant with my kids, and he said that. So it's like really hurtful. It, it, I mean, so this is like, I, we never want to talk about that, but I think childbirth and raising family has a lot of burden on women. Even we work, we have good compensation, but there are a lot of things women need to take care of. When we travel, we need to make arrangements, but mostly husband, like at least for my male uh, coworkers, they all have a full-time housewife. So that, I think I think Wei makes an excellent point. Um, I'm a new mom, so you know it sort of really resonates with me. Um, I am really lucky that my husband uh, is a part-time student, and so he's sort of our primary childcare, primary sort of household care, and I'm sort of like primary moneymaker, and that's the way that our team happens to work. Um, I spoke on a panel similar to this one, um, uh, Silicon Valley Women Leaders Panel at VMware, uh, like a couple months ago, and all the women on the panel um, happen to have uh, partners who supported them, you know, and, and so I think that there is this really major fi family dynamic, and having sort of been pregnant recently, like, it's a really big thing, like, you've got this alien sci-fi thing that's happening to your body and childbirth is like tremendously traumatic and these are things that you know my husband looks at me and he's like I'm here with you but I have no idea what you're really going through so I think the family component is is it's a really big influence yeah, yeah. I want to add something quick I for my from my personal experience right I live in four countries during my life and I gave birth of two, my two children when I live in Canada. Canada has a fantastic social program, right? The parents, father, mother can combine have one year off if you have a child, one year off and being paid. And the daycare system subsided by the government. At that time, 25 years ago, I paid $5 a day for my kid at, at daycare, food, care, everything. Okay, so I moved to the U.S. when my older one was 10 years old. It was hard. I told everyone I wouldn't be able to do my U.S. job if my children were young because my husband worked. And another thing I found out is in the U.S. there's a high percentage of housewife, full-time housewife. I found a lot of my software industry coworkers, a lot of them, their wife do not work, stay home taking care of baby. And even software engineer farm of uh, war wives, once they have a baby, they stop working. They give up and they will stay home until the children become older. So that's a society, the social phenomenon spe specific in the US. Um, so I don't have children, uh, but I plan to someday. And this is something I worry about a lot because I've had many male coworkers who have children, but I've never worked with a woman who has had children. So I have no model for what that looks like. I have no idea what to expect. Um, so that is something I worry about a lot. Um, but one thing that that I think is a really fantastic trend is a lot of Bay Area startups um, and big companies, but but startups especially have really amazing perks. Um, I worked for a startup that offered, that paid for house cleaning, like to bring in a, a to have a house cleaning service come twice a month. Um, that was amazing. Uh, it, uh, a lot of big companies will do laundry service for free, things like that. Like, Aaron, you know, you can get your car serviced on site. Like those kinds of things, they're like ridiculous in some ways, but in, uh, in other ways, like it, it totally makes sense because, especially in the Bay Area, the the reality is that you pretty much do have to have two incomes. Um, so it, it makes sense for the com the companies to kind of step up and um, provide some of the basic um, things that you need in your life that are really really hard to get done when you have two um, two working partners. So I hope that uh, that's like a trend that kind of trickles throughout the th through in, into other industries and other other parts of the country where it becomes more common to have these perks that help with just everyday life things so yeah for me there's there are some things that and I, I see hints that things are changing I, I have kids as well um, my kids are you know middle school aged elementary school aged and it is difficult balancing work and family life, even with um, you know companies that state that they do that. There's still that competition of 
you know, the single colleagues who are willing to stay at all hours and, you know, can be at the office at 8 o'clock where, you know, I'm dropping my kids off at 8 o'clock and I can get there by 9, maybe. <laughs> Fingers crossed that there's no bad, bad traffic. Um, but those demands on families and that it's so, in the U.S. in particular, it falls so disproportionately on women speaks a lot to our fairly rigid roles about what it means to be male and female. And there's kind of this been, um, you know, one of the discussion points in feminist groups is how much sexism damages men as well in holding them to a very rigid role as well as women to a very rigid role. And I, I was lucky to grow up with a single parent and my mother did everything. She, if the car was broke, she fixed it. Fixed it. If things around the house needed to be fixed, she she did that. So I saw that role model as that you know women can do everything, and grew up without that rigid role model of that's that's women's work and that's men's work. And um, so I I think the more we can integrate that as our society as we can change that and have you know have a better discussion on what it means to be men and women and there's far more similarities than there are differences and that's one of the things that I really try and um. I see we have a question and I want to yes. get to your question in just a moment before we get to the question I think we've done a lot of really awesome story shelling, uh, storytelling here and I think it's awesome that mm -hmm. the women here are open enough to share um, there's there's good stuff too, you know, and I wish that this panel was another hour longer. <laughs> and we have opportunities to talk to each other after the panel, but there's good stuff too, and I do think that we should spend some time on the good stuff. Um, you know, yeah. our, our little group met about an hour ago, um, and there's like tremendous resources for girls to increase our pipeline of women. Um, you know, there's there's resources for women in the industry to connect with each other. There's the Executive Women's Forum, there's Grace Hopper, there's Anita Borg, there's a lot of role models. Um, and I think that it's it's worth, you know, we could kind of walk down our line and, and talk about some of the positive things because there's an opportunity for things to go in a really good direction. And then we do want to, we, we do want to answer questions uh, from the attendees as well. Yeah. Well, let's see, we've, we've still got a 15 minute block at the end to answer questions from attendees. So I'd like to get to uh, kind of, I think, what our last question needs to be in a given time is what are the resources and what are the success factors for everybody, to Carolyn's point exactly? Um, you know, what, what are the things that have helped you on your way or? You guys go ahead. Or I can go. So um, one of the things for me was I, I had a I had a boss when I worked at eBay. His name was Dave Cullinan, and he was CISO at the time. And he was like a total woman supporter. And it, and it wasn't like he was a woman supporter. It was like he was a people supporter. And he was trying to build the best team he could. And we had a disproportionate number of women on our information security team at eBay compared to what you might find in the industry or even in technology. So that was totally cool. And he introduced me to this group called the Executive Women's Forum. Uh, it's run by Joyce Bercaglia who runs Alt Associates, which is a re recruiting firm uh, for information security, risk management, and privacy. Uh, and this group of six or so women you know, would go to RSA, they'd go to Black Hat, and they'd run into each other all the time. And they were like, hey, you know, we should hang out. We should make this a thing. And so there's this annual conference. There's all these events that happen. Um, one of the things that they've done to partner with actually Carnegie Mellon, ISC Squared, and the National Cybersecurity Alliance, they've put together this, this curriculum for school children boys and girls, you know, K through 12, and it's like targeted for each of those age groups. So you talk to, you know, a kindergartner about information security differently than you would talk to an eighth grader about information security. But this curriculum is built, it's out there, and they actually encourage people to teach it at your children's schools, or maybe you don't have a kid, you know, teach it at, at one of your local schools. Um, so, so there are these things. Um, so I'm part of this executive women's forums group and uh, you know one night there's like a networking event and I've had a couple glasses of wine and one of my colleagues suggests to me, she's like, you know, you think about this metric stuff a lot. Maybe you should write a book. 
And it hadn't occurred to me before she suggested that, that that was like a thing that was possible, you know? Uh, and sort of fast forward, um, you know, I end up asking some of my female colleagues to be contributors to my book, and so it ends up being this team effort. Um, but, but these are just some of the things uh, that have helped me, you know, great, great mentors uh, and, and resources that are available uh, if, if, if you want to tap into them. Um, also, I like to talk about the resource out there, right? So we talk about um, the pipeline issue. So there are a lot of organizations out there to try to help out. And I personally went out in many occasions to talk to middle school, high school, female student about a life of a software engineer, what is, you know, what they are doing. But also, so one thing you can help is there are few, uh, two of them I really, I think you can help. One is a cold hour. Software engineer donate one hour, go out, coach these kids to program. So that's one, that's a, a comp, uh, that's a organization called Co Hour. It's just anyone can be volunteer. I think Samantha organized one of these events in December, right? For ask software engineer to volunteer. Second is Girls Who Code, right? There's a movie. Uh, so these are the resources out there in your community. I'm sure there are many, many of them. Uh, but also for career women, there are a lot of other organizations out there. Anita Borg Institute is one of them, and it organizes the world's largest conference for women in computing called Grace Hopper Celebration for Women in Computing. Every year, um, the last year, attendance reached to 12,000 people coming from all over the world and they are content to uh, address student, early career, mid-career, and senior career level. Uh, US CTO Smith, uh, Megan Smith is a friend of this conference. Every year she comes, talk about, give a key speak those. Last year she brought her team, US government team, female team to the conference. Cheryl Sandberg was a keynote as well. Uh, so many of these resources out there, uh, if you are interested, I can give you more information. I have been involved in that conference for a very long time. So anyway, we can talk afterwards. I want to give a chance to others. Um, I'll just give a really quick plug for something that Google does. Uh, it, um, there's a highly encouraged unconscious bias training that Google offers. Um, and many, many employees do it. If you work for a large company, I think there's probably a good chance that your company offers something like this. Uh, it's a, it's, I think it, it's incredibly valuable for pretty much everyone in the industry. Um, it helps you identify your own biases and also helps you deal with situations where you might um, be uncomfortable or see a situation where someone else is uncomfortable. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hope that it's available to many of you uh, from your companies, and if it isn't, then it might be a good thing to uh, ask your, your leadership why, why, it, why it isn't, because I think it's something that everyone in a professional working environment should uh, have, have access to. Yeah, I know there's a, I, and I'm, I'm sorry the name escapes me, but it's, I think it's Harvard or one of the East Coast universities that does have a, an unconscious bias catalog and some resources that are free online. And available, and um, you know, for me, some of the best resources are expanding my mentor network and getting a hold of some, you know, working out some good mentor relationships. One of the early mistakes that I personally made was looking for female mentors specifically, because <laughs> they're usually really busy. And expanding that to, you know, I've got a lot of really great male colleagues, and looking at them as mentors and figuring out some of these things can really help. Um, you know, give me the mentor network to progress my career, and so I hope that is useful advice and helpful for other people as well, is really figuring out those mentor relationships, because they're very valuable, whether they're a, an organization like EWF or, you know, personal friendships that you develop and, um, and leverage from that. So, and I think we're, um, we are at our Q&A system, so, or session, so we have time for questions. Uh, the gentleman in the purple had a question. Yeah, first just a uh, comment, because I can totally see the, the potential problems around the whole. Some have house, housewives, others give birth. Uh, but I come from Sweden originally, where housewives are almost extinct. And we have highly subsidized childcare 
and the numbers are the same. Almost no women in tech, almost no women in uh, security tech. Interesting. So I, I don't know. Uh, maybe there's no really, I would even say I've met more professional women in security in the US than in Sweden, proportionally. Uh, so something to think about. Uh, but I wanted to ask one thing about this whole bias and like you meet women and you assume that they're not into tech, they do soft things. I can totally see that. I was working with it heavily when I was a teacher at university, trying to make sure I would think of uh, every woman or man that I met as a student could be the next superhero. And you really need to train yourself to think that, that way, not like assume that the superhero has to be a guy. Uh, so and one thing I've noted is that uh, many men try to signal early, like having a geeky t-shirt, maybe as the one I'm having right now, <laughs> about filing a radar, to shade that thing off, to, to make people know immediately, oh, okay, that's an Emacs person. Then, then you, you kind of assume that, well, I can bring up geeky things with this. Do you, have you seen any such things working? Would that be a way to do it? I, I, I think this is an, an interesting idea, right? Is there a signal that you can give, like, hey, I'm a technical person, talk to me about... The, we're at a technical conference, right? And we're here. So I think, so I think that's cool. And, and I think the Sweden thing is interesting, too, because, you know, around the world... So we can kind of zoom out, and we can say, around the world, this problem looks different in different places. Um, we're in the United States, and we're having a conference about application security, and there is a women in security panel, and that's totally cool. I can almost guarantee you this is not happening in Japan. Um, and, and in Sweden, they've got way awesomer childcare. And in Canada, they've got way awesomer childcare than the United States. So it's different. I, I also want to note that um, another, another theme here that we want to briefly call out explicitly is that the bigger picture is not about women, it's about diversity, right? So we look around and, and there's a diversity situation. My uh, husband's sister, is a single mom of four kids, four dads, all half African American. They live in Indianapolis. And my daughter, who is growing up in San Francisco, will have different opportunities than her cousins. And I'm so excited that we're flying out my 10-year-old nephew, RJ, to San Francisco to stay with us for two weeks so he can see like this different version of the world. You know, And there's all of this. Uh, you know, Lisa can speak to some of the Harvard Business Review studies that's been done recently that says, Diversity on teams helps make better decisions. And it's kind of like, no duh, right? If people think differently about a problem, there are more opportunities to solve it in different ways. Um, so, yeah. Hi, um, so I've been in the business for a long time and I've had many, many managers. And I can say, uh, it's pretty clear to me that the best managers I've ever had were women. Um, it, now, it might be a, at least the best working relationships I've had with, with my manager have been women. It might be a coincidence, but I think probably not. Um, my non-expert theory is, is that when you get men together, there's always this kind of testosterone thing going on that just kind of clouds judgments. Um, whereas when you have a male against female, no matter who's in the you know, subordinate position, there's just less of that stuff going on, and you make just better um, decisions and judgments. So. Um, in a male-dominated industry, um, I'm wondering what your guys' thoughts are on whether it's just possible that women might be better managers in a male-dominated industry, and, and why? Do you I mean do you get the same sense? Let's see. So, for me, <clears throat> and there's another question in the back there too. Um, the uh, for me, any time you get a a homogenous group, you're going to have, you're, you've got clouded judgment. You can't see the full picture. The more diverse your group, right, you know, if you've got people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different visibility, you're going to make better decisions. It tones down that, that competition, the, the testosterone cloud, whatever you want to call it. Um, when you have a more diverse group making the decisions. Um, we talked earlier today about the, um, 
uh, you know, the some company cultures can have a, what amounts to a bullying culture, where you know the loudest voice wins. It's not really about um, what the best solution is, but who's willing to fight to the death for that solution. And uh, with a with a diverse team, with people from different walks of life, different sexes, that we have what we've all experienced, I think, fairly universally, is that the better diversity representation on the team, the better decisions are made, the less of a bullying culture is allowed to form and persist. Um, to answer Dermot's question, right, will, would woman be a better manager, right? I, I think that per my experience, it's all about the dynamic of the group, manager and the subordinates, right? how each other view each other's value, how they can uh, work together as a team. That is the huge uh, decision fact, uh, defective factor to influence that relationship, right? There are cases that you can come up very well with a female leader, a group of male subordinates, no problem raised. But it can also come up with a situation where a female leader just have few people just can't work out. I personally experienced these cases that I had pure male group, never had a problem. And recently I had a problem. I have a diversity team where one male person just didn't work out with the other female person. That also affects the relationship I had with that male subordinate. So at the end, my reflection is really the dynamics. The dynamics among these people. Can you guys work well together? If you can't, no matter what, no matter how good the manager is, no matter how good that team is, things just won't work out. Very good. Oh, okay. So I do some mentoring for um, my school, and part of it is that I always tell them like what I do, engineering and everything, and the first thing that comes to their, mi their mind is like, wow, that's too intense for women and it, it's intimidating. And I try to encourage them, no, it just takes a lot of work. You have to work a lot. Like, and I don't know if what have you tried in terms of encouraging women on a one-on-one -on -one basis or maybe in a small group settings that kind of said, wow, I can really do this. I mean, I've tried many times and hopefully it reaches them, but I just wanted to see what have you guys tried and what worked. I, I've read. I will answer your question in an indirect way. I've, I've read this book recently, and I highly recommend it. It's called I Know How She Does It. And this author went and talked to maybe like hundreds of women who made over 100K a year and who also had families. And her theory was that these women have something figured out. And what she asked them to do was to keep time logs in 30 increment 30 minute increments for two weeks. And they wrote down everything that they did. And she found out that there is this, there's this lie about working so hard. Sometimes. Some people actually work 100 hours a week. Some people work 35 hours a week and they say they work 50 hours a week. And there is this like cool thing about like, oh, I work so hard, I'm so tired. And it's like, some of that is real and some of it is not. And what's unfortunate about it is that if somebody believes that it's real but it's not then they make decisions based on the lie and this this book is super cool because she's like these women make tons of money they've got really great jobs they manage their families actually they don't work more than 40 hours a week there's this total misbelief if I look at my lifestyle and I compare that to one of my friends who is a great school teacher you know and I ask a kid and they're 10 or 15 or 20, you know, who do you think has like a tougher time at work? And I would totally say my friend who's the teacher has a tougher time. And a lot of that for me personally is because I get to work from home so much of the time. You know, but that's one of the cool things about working in tech. There are some jobs where, because it happens with a laptop and with a cell phone, you get to work from home. My teacher friend can't work from home. She can't be with her, you know, 10 month old son the way that I get to be with my 10 month old daughter because 
of this technology difference. So there are these lies that are propagated. You know, we get we get programmed unconsciously a lot of the time from from child from from childbirth. You know, when you look at your your daughter maybe and you say, you know, you're in charge of harmony. You know, you need you know everything needs to be cool and you're kind of in charge of making sure everyone gets along. So maybe that's why some women are great managers. You know, and you look at your little boy and you're like, you know, you got to earn the money. You know, you better study hard or something. Whatever it is, you know these things. Um, but I think that there are there are lies. And one of the lies is, oh, I work so much. And that's not always a lie, but sometimes it's a lie. So this book, uh, I know how she does it. Uh, totally cool, not only for women, but also maybe for men who are like, well, maybe there's a way for me to live my life and spend my hours a little differently to make me happier. Mm -hmm. um, just one thing I want to add about that is, uh, I think when a little girl might say like that, career looks too intense or like I that's too intimidating I don't want to be an engineer I don't think that I, I think what she's actually saying is like that is foreign to me like it looks it looks different than me uh, because no one would say that being a doctor is not an intense career but the gender imbalance has uh, has evened out there uh, so I, I don't think it's really that children think that something is too intense for them. I think it's just a way of saying like, it's not me, it doesn't look like me, I can't see myself doing that. So I, I don't know if that, that's not particularly constructive, but like, you know, if someone were to, were to say that to me, I think I would say like, you can do something intense. Like there's no reason that, that you shouldn't be able to do that intense career as compared to a million other intense careers that you would be interested in. So unfortunately, I think it's more, it's more likely a problem of a lack of role models or a lack of like um, cultural, or uh, the, the, the presence of stereotypes that contributes to that. That's just my gut feeling though. I know we are end of time. Uh, so quickly, um, so there are a lot of events, right? I went to talk to these students female students and when I ask questions, I asked three questions at the beginning. Who wants, who wants to become a doctor? A lot of hands. Who wants to be a lawyer? A lot of hands. Who wants to be an engineer? One or two hands only, right? So exposure, hard wiring, and maybe one thing I suggest, I recommend you to do, I did with my daughters. When they were in high middle school, I gave them one summer project each. Look at, choose three potential professions you want to be in the future, do study. Study on how the study lands, how hard, how et cetera. Second is when you can really get into that field, job opportunity, and third is the money you can earn. Do this and come back, tell me what you want to be. I think that they did that, they choose what they want to be and they all end up where they are. Unfortunately, they are not engineers. I, feel, I feel ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a, a, at least right. They went through this, they learned, they understood, and they said, okay, that's what I want to do. So today they don't have regret. Even both of them work very hard, very, very hard. One even work harder than software engineer I manage but they are very happy in what they do. So I think that's another way to teach them, give them a chance to find out by themselves. Well, I'd like to thank everybody. We got some really amazing insights and, uh, and hopefully the audience got a, a good discussion and some things to think about and consider. And uh, I love, all of the feedback seems that we're all working to get more women in technology, in security. I think having a more diverse population just improves the field tremendously. So uh, thank you all for participating in the discussion and thank you to our panelists, Carolyn, Wei, <laughs> and Emily. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.